was, of course, the um, Hare Krishna land affair, purchasing of Hare Krishna land, which we now have our big Radharaspi Hare temple on. Uh, Prabhupada uh, was advised about this land by one devotee, Tusta Krishna. Prabhupada was in New Delhi at the time. He came down. Tusta Krishna had made friends with one Mr. Nair, who was the, um, I think, owner, huh? Who was the owner of Indian, no, Free Press, Free Press Journal. Free Press Journal, yeah. Anyway, um, it's a very long story, which uh, His Holiness Giri Raj Maharaj will be writing in detail about. He's writing a book now about this. Uh, but um, it took, you know, Prabhupada got into a negotiation with him. And after a long time, we signed a sales agreement. And this sale agreement, um, Mr. Nair had really no plan to fulfill the agreement. And uh, after a certain amount of time, it ran out of time. The sale agreement ran out of time. And we could not sign the conveyance, which is the final document of change of title. So uh, a long, long, long period ensued in between in which Mr. Nair tried to remove the devotees from the land. It's a very, I mean, it's big history of part of the history of ISKCON. And there are many heroic battles that were fought. Prabhupada said it was like Kurukshetra. Um, so um, even to the point of the temple, the temporary temple was demolished. Prabhupada had installed Radharas Bihari at the Bombay Pandal, and then he put the deity there and he prayed to the deity, my dear Lord, now I'm <coughs> requesting you to sit down here and I will arrange everything for you, but don't leave. And Prabhupada made this promise to the deity. And, you know, so many things happened trying to get the deity and the devotees off the land. And wherever Prabhupada was all over the world, this was just constantly in his mind. You know, Hare Krishna land, Hare Krishna land, Hare Krishna land. So finally, Prabhupada came back and, you know, the, after a long tussle, again, we were in Hyderabad. And uh, Prabhupada arranged for Mr. Nair to come to meet him. We were staying at the house of one Mr. Panavalpiti, Pitti, a very wealthy man, the wealthiest man in Hyderabad City. And uh, Mr. Nair came with his guru, who was some type of a pseudo-guru. And the purpose of bringing his guru was that Mr. Nair felt that Prabhupada had some type of mystic power, and he would put some spell on him and, you know, take the land. So after uh, a big dinner, Prabhupada was yawning, and Mr. Nair and his guru immediately said, Swamiji, I think that you must be getting tired. We should let you rest. And Prabhupada said, I'm very tired. So he retired, and immediately Mr. Nair and his guru went to sleep in the next room. So after about five minutes, Prabhupada's secretary called me into the room. Prabhupada wasn't sleeping at all. Although Prabhupada always slept after eating, everybody knows this, but he wasn't sleeping. So Prabhupada said, what are they doing? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, uh, they're sleeping. He said, go in there and wake up Mr. Naya, but don't wake up the guru. <laughs> <laughs> so I went there, you know, to the side of the bed and I shook Mr. Naya's arm. And Mr. Naya, I said, Prabhupada wants to see you. Shh. You know, and I, I pointed out your guru's sleeping, don't wake up your guru. So I took Mr. Nair in the room and Prabhupada just started to preach to him. And, you know, Mr. Nair was just sitting there and he's listening and listening. And gradually Prabhupada got him to agree to sign the agreement all over again. And he told Shamsun and me, immediately go in and type the whole agreement out. So we went in and we started typing on the mechanic, you know, that, you know, typewriter, old typewriter Prabhupada had. Typed it out, Prabhupada got it signed. And by the time he finished signing, you know, the guru got up, you know, and he came in, and Mr. Nair, you know, had signed away the land again. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Mr. Nair just kept hitting his head. He said, what have I done? You know, what have I done? Prabhupada said, it's okay. 
Shishi Gorni Tai Ki, Sisi Ripini Dorkadish Ki, Sri Jagannan Baladev Subhadra Devi Ki. What do we do? Keep, is there an RT now? Or? Organizers? All right. So, uh, you know, but it was done. There was nothing that could be done. So at that point, Prabhupada sent us back. We had to accompany Mr. Nair back to Bombay. And we took this old flight, hopping flight, was bouncing like anything, propeller plane. Myself, Shem Sundar, and Mr. Nair. Anyway, as it turned out, the lawyers, our own lawyers, were actually working in cahoots with Mr. Nair and Mr. Nair's lawyers. And so, in a period of 10 days, they convinced Shem Sundar and I that there was the greatest blunder to go ahead with this contract. So, once again, you know, this is another fatal blunder. <laughs> we canceled the contract. We let it run out without fulfilling it. So, Prabhupada, I think, was in Pune, and I called him up to tell him the good news. <laughs> so I said, Srila Prabhupada, you know, uh, I wanted to call you to tell you. He said, what has happened? Did you, you know, did everything go through? And I said, no, Srila Prabhupada. We canceled the uh, contract. And all I heard was, click. <laughs> Prabhupada just hung the phone up. Prabhupada came back. And then for the, about the next two months, Prabhupada would call in one member after the other, and he would wheel, you know, sort of parade me in. And he'd say, this foolish boy, and he'd show him the contract, and he said, he canceled the contract. He canceled the contract. You know, and I was anyway, this was such a huge blunder. So, uh, the thing I feel about these, and there were many, there were more such blunders that went on in time. But I think that the um, wonderful quality of Prabhupada through all of these is that he never gave up on a devotee or on a disciple. No matter how many mistakes a devotee might make, he uh, wanted to see if a devotee would continue to want to serve Krishna and to serve him. Uh, in that instance, with the cancellation of the contract, Prabhupada did not reject me. He, um, gave me the opportunity to go through, you know, a hellish year and a half after that with Giriraj Marsh, <laughs> where we had to go, you know, all the time into Bombay, sitting in the lawyers' chambers, and uh, just trying to rectify the situation. So it's a um, symptom of Srila Prabhupada that he never gave up on a devotee. He said about Krishna that when you chant Hare Krishna even one time sincerely, that Krishna will never leave you alone. So I feel uh, the same way, uh, that Prabhupada never leaves you alone. Uh, even you may make many mistakes in his service, still he does not reject you. But he accepts you just as a father would accept a child, a parent accepts a child. He expects that there may be mistakes, he will chastise you like anything, but he never gives you the sense that he doesn't love you. So despite all of the grand mistakes that were made, I never got the sense that Prabhupada loved me less because of them. And um, I, I always felt encouraged and never felt discouraged, even when you know, these mistakes occurred. Prabhupada had a devotee there who was a Sikh by birth, he joined us, and Giriraj Swami and myself, and <coughs> this devotee, uh, his name was uh, Chaitanya Guru at the time, Chaitanya Guru. So he was uh, driving us around, and we would be going, making members, and collecting money to build the Vrindavan Temple in Bombay. So after a while, this devotee somehow got it in his mind that he should go off on his own and leave and make his own way spiritually in life. And he took up living on Juhu Beach with one bogey yogi, with the intention of learning 
the art of passing a coin from one ear <laughs> out the other ear. <laughs> so before he had done this, he was already canvassing from our members, collecting on his own. So I had approached Prabhupada, the Srila Prabhupada, this person, we have to write something to our members to warn them about this person. So Prabhupada was a little hesitant to do that. Then finally, you know, but he, he was not ready to give up on this devotee. But when this devotee finally started to live with that bogey yogi, I said, Prabhupada, now it's reached the limit. You know, this person is on the beach living with a bogus yogi, trying to learn how to pass the coin from one ear out the other. <laughs> so I said that now, you know, there, it's the end, it's finished. And Prabhupada looked at me and he said, you do not know about Lord Nityananda's mercy. I said, why, Srila Prabhupada? He said, because there is no end to Lord Nityananda's forgiveness. And later on, sure enough, that devotee came back. And again, Prabhupada tried to help him. He gave this person sannyas even. And the person eventually left. That's, you know, but I met him maybe a year ago, and he's still on some spiritual path of some type. But Prabhupada was so clear, he looked at me, and he said, there's no limit to Lord Nityananda's mercy and compassion. So Srila Prabhupada is the manifest representative of Lord Nityananda Prabhu. And uh, his forgiveness is like that. So I think that in terms of our, both our dealing with our own shortcomings and in terms of dealing with each other, we have to always remember that Prabhupada never rejected a devotee. There's very, very, very few instances in the history where Prabhupada, you know, did so. It was very, 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 very rare. Jai <laughs> Prachu. <laughs>